Amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Amen. 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 Turn to somebody and say, God is good. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated this morning. It's uh, always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And uh, I do want to continue this series I'm teaching on who is Jesus. And uh, it's important for us to know how he defines himself instead of how we might want to define him or how the world defines him for us. Uh, we need to know how to define him uh, based on his word. Amen. Now, I, before I get into to the scripture, and I'm going to be in John chapter 1 uh, here in just a little bit if you want to turn there. Uh, but I don't know if y'all have noticed, if you've been here at the church for a while, maybe you've noticed, but I have gotten older. Have you noticed that, Nikki? Do, right? Some, thank you, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, some of you may ha have noticed that. And, and the older you get, your body does weird stuff. Your mind thinks, I can do that. And your body says, no, you can't. Right? Can I get an amen? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Obadiah? You know? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. And so yesterday, I was at my desk at home, and I dropped a pen. And I'm standing there. And so I'm thinking in my mind, I'm going to bend down. I'm going to pick up that pen. And so I go down, and I, and I go to pick up the pen, and I, and I miss it just by that much. You ever done that? You go down, and you just miss it by that much? Somebody, you understand what I'm talking about. I can tell right now you understand. And so, you know, I go down, and I come right back up. I, I missed. I missed the pen. So I go right back down, and I miss it again. And I go down the third time, and I miss it the third I stop. I said, what is going on with me? And, and so instead of bending down, I get on my knees and I make sure that I grab the pen and, and I was stuck in this cycle and I couldn't get out. And, and so sometimes in life you get stuck in a cycle doing the same thing over and over again, but God wants to break us free. Amen. He don't want you doing the same old thing over and over and over again, especially if it's not good for you. And especially if you're old, right? Amen. Amen. So, so I want to talk about, uh, this, this idea, who is Jesus? The first week, just to give you a little bit of review, we talked about him as the Messiah. And then the second week as the Son, both the Son of God and the Son of Man. Last week, we talked about him as the Word or the Logos and what that means. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about who is Jesus as the Lamb of God. Amen? Everybody say the Lamb of God. And let's read this in John chapter 1, verse 29. And this is about John the Baptist testifying about Jesus. It says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I have testified that this is God's chosen one. Amen. So I want you to understand, so John the Baptist, he's out baptizing everybody, and people are coming to him, and, and what he is saying here is that when Jesus walked up, he did not know that Jesus was the Messiah until the Spirit revealed it to him right then. And so when the Spirit reveals to him that Jesus is the Messiah, his, his mindset is, and the title that came to his mind was, look, the Lamb of God. Now, there are so many different titles for Jesus all throughout the Scripture. The Lion of the tribe of Judah. He, he is the, the Great I Am. He is the Mighty Counselor. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Rose of Sharon. I mean, we could go through so many. But of all the different titles, the one the Holy Spirit gives to John the Baptist is, Look, the Lamb of God. Amen? It says, The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. And so I want to talk to you today, why the Lamb? Why is that the title? And then why is that a title at all for Jesus? And so the context here, uh, John the Baptist is out there 
uh, preaching and teaching and he is baptizing people and he's out, he's dressed weird and he looks weird and people are coming to listen to him. Kind of feels familiar to me. And, and so uh, when you look weird and you sound weird and people still listen to you, you think that's got to be God, right? And so that's what's happening. And so they come up to him, the Pharisees, and they say, are you the Messiah? Because there's so many people coming out to him. Are you the Messiah? And he says, no, I am a voice calling out in the wilderness. And he is quoting scripture there. So John the Baptist may not have known who Jesus was in that moment until the Spirit revealed it to him, but he knew who he was. And in that moment, when they asked him, are you the Messiah? He is now quoting out of the prophet Isaiah. And I want to read that to you in Isaiah 40, verse 1. It says, comfort for God's people. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now this is written 800 years before John the Baptist is born. And so John recognizes, I'm that guy. I'm that guy. And what is he doing? He, he is talking about this time where the sin of the world is going to be wiped away or the sin of Israel, that what they have been through is completed, that their hard service is over. And so he is declaring that is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we begin to understand why he's using that title because he understands he is the one preparing the way for the one who is going to take away the sin of the world because their time is complete. Their time of suffering is complete. And so when you think about the lamb, the first thing I want you to get is he takes away the sin of the world. Amen? Everybody say takes away. Now, we understand forgiveness, but sin is much more than just what you do. It's the effect of what you do. And we live in a sinful world, and so sin is much more than what I do and the effect that what I do has on my life, but it's what I do. It's the sin in my life and the effect it has on other people. It's the sin that you commit and the effects that it has on you, your own spirit, and the people around you. And and if all the scripture hangs on two things, loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself, then sin is the absence of love. So there are many moments in our life when we are acting without love, outside of love, and when we do that, we hurt And we cause a great amount of pain. We cause a great amount of harm. We do things that we wish we could take back. We say things we wish we could take back. And so when it says that the Lamb of God takes away the sin, he's also taking away the effects. He's taking away what happens to us when we sin. He's taking away the hurt that we have when others have sinned. He is covering sin and all that it means. Amen? And so this is the Lamb of God. And and so he is not just saying you are forgiven, but he's restoring hope that all the issues that we suffer with in life because of our sin and because of the sins of other people, there is hope that life can be better. Sin puts us in this negative cycle where I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again. I have the same arguments with people. I have the same offense, the same habits, the same addictions, the same everything. And I'm just stuck in it all the time. And so the Lamb of God is this mindset, this this way that God is coming and saying, I'm going to help you break free from all the cycles. I'm going to help you break free from the effect. I'm going to help you break free from what your dad did, your mom did, what what other people. I'm going to help you break free from what you have been doing that's been destroying your own soul so that you can do something, be something different. Amen? This is the Lamb of God. But the question that I really want to get into today is why a lamb? Why does God choose a lamb? Of all the animal kingdom, why does God choose a lamb? And, and we know that he also chose a lion, but he chose a lamb. I mean, he could have chosen an aardvark. He could have chosen a porcupine. He could have chosen a, a you know, in, anything in the animal kingdom, but he chooses a lamb. And so why? Why does he choose a lamb? And so to get into this, I want to remind you that Jesus is the second Adam. So Adam came, Adam sinned, and when Adam sinned, then sin entered into the whole world. Everybody say it's Adam's fault. No, Eve did it for, no, I'm kidding. I'm not, I'm not going to get into that today. So Adam sins, and when Adam sins, everybody becomes sinful. And it seems like that's a very unfair thing for God to do. But God does this so that later another man named Jesus can come and undo what Adam did. 
And so Jesus is called the second Adam. And so in order for man's sins to be done away with, a man who does not have sin must take the punishment of all mankind and all the sins of the world. And so Jesus becomes that man. And so now Jesus is the lamb. Everybody say the lamb. And so now the lamb is representing Jesus, and Jesus has become a man so that he can be sacrificed. The lamb represents us. The lamb represents me and you. Turn to somebody and say, you smell like, no, don't say that. So why a lamb? So a little bit, a little bit about lambs. I'm not a farmer, but I know how to Google. And, uh, and so uh, lambs have no defense mechanism. They cannot defend themselves at all. They can't bite, they can't scratch, they can't claw, they, they are slow, they, they, don't, they cannot defend. What they do when they smell danger is they all get in a big group together. And if you're the last one in, hmm, it ain't going to go good for you, right? They cannot defend themselves at all. The other thing they do is they blindly follow. If one starts walking, they just all start going. They don't care where they're going. They may be walking off a cliff. They don't care. They just follow. They blindly follow. And, and then the last thing is if they're eating or if they're drinking and, and the shepherd begins to call them to go away somewhere else, if they're eating or drinking, they don't want to go. They're going to stay right there even if, it, if there's danger. And so that's why the shepherd has a crook, right, so he can grab them and, and take them. So a lamb is stubborn. Are you stubborn? Amen. Sorry. Praise God for honesty. That's good right there. No, that's good. <laughs> Where's Mario? <laughs> Mario needs to hear that. <clears throat> we, we are all stubborn. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, he's talking to you, right? We're all stubborn. We, we are all blindly following. And we may not think we're blindly following, but there are certain things that we do just because everybody else does it. Even if we're Christians, many times we do things just because other Christians are doing it. But if you look at society and just the, the mankind, we just follow whatever started. That's why you have this idea of social trends and what's trending. And it's because once somebody does it, then somebody else does it and somebody else does it. And, and it just begins to follow. That's how fashion changes. You know, there, there are trendsetters. There are people that, that change fashion and they'll show up and they look weird. And everybody's saying that is the weirdest thing. Can you imagine the first time somebody made some bell bottoms? Right? I know young people don't even know what that is, but, uh, you know, these pants with giant, you know, huge right here, because they never seen that before. Somebody had to make that in their house and then go to school or go to work with these giant things. Can you imagine how much people made fun of them? And then for some reason, everybody said, hmm, why don't we try that? And the next thing you know, the whole hippie generation is full of bell bottoms, and now they're coming back now, and, and you're seeing them again. And, and so there was this thing, and we blindly follow, but we do it morally, we do it ethically, we do it in so many different ways. A lot of times we're following family members, well, my dad did this, well, I'm going to do that. And, and we don't even realize we're doing it. Sometimes when I'm acting a certain way, I will hear things come out of my mouth that are my dad's words that he used to say to me, and I used to think I will never say that to my kids. Well, then I do, right? And it's a good thing. It was a good thing he said it to me. But we blindly follow. But then finally, we are defenseless. When the enemy comes against us without Christ, without the Holy Spirit, without the angels of God, we are defenseless. We can do nothing. We can't stand up against them. We can't fight back. We are defenseless. So, so we are the lambs. So Jesus is the lamb of God, but he is representing man because lambs are like us. And all we do is just kind of gather up in a group, and, and we hope that we're there, but we can't defend ourselves. We are stubborn, and, and, and we, we follow blindly. Uh, and then the last thing is we cannot clean ourselves, right? So when a lamb gets all nasty and dirty, somebody's got to come and shear the lamb. That's why you got, uh, you know, what do you call them? Shearers. That's what you call them, right? And these people, they do that. Because when we get dirty morally, ethically, we can't undo it. Only Christ can give us a new, a new life, a new, a new creation. Amen? And so this is why it's a lamb, right? So why is he a lamb? Because he's representing us. We are like lambs. But let me go a little bit deeper. The first time we see lambs in the scripture and there is a sacrifice, it is in Egypt. 
And if you remember the Hebrews, uh, the Israelites, they had been enslaved by the Egyptians for 400 years. And then Moses came up. He says, let my people go. And, and so they go through the plagues. And the last plague is, is the, the shadow of death, the angel of death that kills every firstborn. And God says to them, you take a lamb and you slaughter it and you put the blood on the top and the sides of your doorposts. And when the angel of death comes over and passes over you, because it sees the blood, there will be no death in your house. And so all the Egyptians lost their firstborn, but the Israelites did not. And so all of the plagues, if you go back and look at them, the frogs and the gnats and the flies, all of these are connected to gods of Egypt. What God is doing is he is revealing to Egypt every one of their gods is impotent. And one of the main gods of Egypt was a ram. Now, a ram is a one-year-old male lamb that is old enough now to start button heads. So this is a, a, a lamb that is stubborn, even more than just regular. It is a lamb that's ready to fight. It's a lamb that is going to resist. That's who they worshiped. But more than that, Israel has been in Egypt for 400 years, and we know from all the other prophets that Israel had begun to worship the same gods as Egypt. And so Israel is also worshiping a ram or a lamb. And so you, you have this, this idea that this is who we are. We are rams. We are lambs. We are defenseless. We follow blindly. We are stubborn. But they represent people, and yet they are a god. So the lambs represent you and I, but they were being worshipped. And so what God is doing here, he has given us a picture, a symbolic picture of self-worship, self-idolatry. He is saying that, that you have been born sinful, and because of that sinful nature, now the, the proclivity you have without even trying is you elevate yourself above everything else. This is who we are. This is who you are, it's who I am. I don't have to work at it. It takes no effort at all for me to elevate self, but it takes a lot of effort for me to honor God. That's why the Scripture says make every effort to add to your faith. And so you have this, this, this natural proclivity. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to work at it. I am naturally going to think about and go after what I want. And so I become very um, set. I need this. I need this. I want this. And I'm going after what I want. And, and what I'm doing is I'm saying I am more important than anybody else. I'm more important than God. I don't care what God wants. And, and so it takes no effort. It's easy to do. Can I get an amen? It's easy to be selfish. You don't have to work at being selfish. Amen. The little four-year-old that takes the cookie, and he wanted the cookie, but mom said, you can't have the cookie. And so the cookie's gone, and mom said, did you take the cookie? And what does he say? I didn't take the cookie. He's got chocolate over his mouth. You know he took the cookie. He doesn't have to go to school to learn how to lie. He doesn't have to go to school to learn how to manipulate to get what he wants. He doesn't have to go to school in order to learn how to deceive. It is natural, and we still do it today. Why a lamb? Because we are the lamb. Amen? It takes no effort. It, it is so easy to be selfish. And so when God is setting up the sacrificial system, and the lamb represents us, and now he's saying the lamb has to die. And it has to be done. Let me read this to you in Ezekiel 46, 13. He says, every day you are to provide a year old lamb without defect for a burnt offering to the Lord. Morning by morning you shall provide it. And so this was God saying every single day a lamb needs to be sacrificed. Every single day we have to die to self. Every single day, I have to understand who I am naturally is not godly, and so I need the Holy Spirit to help me die to myself so that I'm not living for what I want and going after what I want, but I'm doing what God wants me to do. Amen? And so it is something that we have to do every single day, and it's not easy. Every day, I got to remind myself that he's God and I'm not. Amen? You know, when, 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 when you have a temptation in front of you, and it is very easy to say, but I want that bluebell ice cream so bad. And God say, well, you've had enough. <laughs> it's not easy, and we need help. We need help. I know I should be nice to my wife. I know I should be a good father. 
I know I should pray every day, but Lord, I'm busy. I got to run. I got to rush. I got to be here. I got to be there. And what are we doing? We're saying, Lord, your way is not the best way. You're not as, I'm going to do it my way. And it's more important for me to get to work on time than to pray. And we self-elevate and it takes no effort. We do it easily. Amen. So God is setting up this picture in Egypt now where you have everybody is worshiping these lambs, these rams that represent us, that represent them, that represent people, and they are rebellious, they are egotistical, they are arrogant, they are narcissistic, and they are self-elevating. Uh, I've had some people that, you know, I've tried to talk to God about uh, or two, and they've said, why do I need God? My life is great. You ever run anybody? Uh, there's not a lot of people like that, but there are some people that think, my life is great. Why do I need God? Because without God, you become a self-centered, egotistical, narcissistic person. So even your good deeds are for you. You're doing it for self-aggrandizement. You're doing it so everybody can look at you. You love those who love you, but the people who don't love you, you can't love them because you're wrapped up in your sinfulness. See, if, if I don't get God, then this is who I become. I'm just a sheep. I'm a lamb over and over again, always wrapped up in my own self-centeredness, and, and I can't get beyond that, so I can't love people that don't love me. So as soon as my teenage son rebels against me, I'm done. I'm out because he's not going to treat me with respect, so I'm done loving him. And so we, we need this or else that's who we become and we just live into it till the very end of our day. And, and the people that we've been nice to are only the people that have been nice to us. And we've made no difference in the world. Amen. So here God is setting this up and he said, here are the rams, they represent you and the ram must die. The ram must die. This is the Christian experience, learning to die to self and it's hard. Amen. I used to... Thank God, when I got saved, why didn't you just take the capacity to sin out of me? I mean, I gave you my heart. Why don't you just, just make it where I can't be tempted by anything? But instead, I have this struggle, and, and there are temptations, and there are things that are difficult. And, and, and I used to think, Lord, if, if I'm saved, why, why don't you just take me straight to heaven? And that way, as soon as I give my heart to you, I'm done. I'm up in heaven. Everything is good. I can't sin anymore. I'm not going to hurt anybody else. I'm not going to hurt myself. Why don't I just go to heaven? Wouldn't that be nice? The problem is, is that God is invisible. And so God needs somebody who is visible in order to be a witness to him because he's invisible. And so even though you get saved, God says, I'm going to leave you in the world. Remember, he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, don't take them out of the world, leave them in the world, but give them strength. Amen? And so he leaves us here so that we can be witnesses, so we can testify to how good God is. We don't get to go straight to heaven because he has work for us to do. But in that, then we are stuck in the struggle. And there's always a temptation. There's always, and we so easily fall into it, and we find ourselves doing the very things that we hate. And we find ourselves hurting the very people that we love. Jesus, as the Lamb of God, says, I am going to break the power of sin so that you don't have to live like that anymore. Amen? The Bible says in, in Revelation that they were, they were looking for somebody who could open the scroll. And it says no one was worthy to open the scroll. And one of the angels came to John who's having this vision. And he says, don't worry because the lion of the tribe of Judah, he is worthy. The lion of the tribe of Judah is Jesus. Amen? And, and so he is victorious. Everybody understands a lion is the king of the jungle. And so he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But then when he shows up to open the scroll, he shows up in the form of a lamb that has been slain. And, and so what he's saying here is the power that is released when I die, you move from being a lamb to a lion. You, you don't have to be stuck in that same cycle. You don't have to be the same person. You don't have to keep falling into the same trap of your natural proclivity. But you can have a different mindset, a different power, a different life. You can be free from all of that stuff. You don't have to be a, lion, a lamb forever. You can be a lion. Amen? 
And, and so when, when we're talking about this, this is the blood, this is what he's doing. It is blood to cover my sins, to rescue me from myself. And so when we say Jesus is the lamb, this is Jesus saying, I am releasing power to help you break the negative cycles of your past so you don't have to keep making the same mistakes, committing the same sin, hurting the same people, doing the same stuff. You can be brand new. Amen? This is what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7 about this struggle. He says, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin that's at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. He's saying this is a struggle. The apostle Paul is the maturity level of him is, is more than anything that we might understand. You have Jesus, you have the apostle Paul, and the apostle Paul in the height of his ministry, in the height of his holiness, in the height of his servanthood to Christ saying, sometimes I mess up. But thanks be to God, I don't have to stay in that cycle. I can be different. Amen? Now, Israel was enslaved to Egypt. And so Israel's peace, Israel's demeanor, Israel and who they were and how they experienced life was all dependent upon Egypt. And so if if the Egyptians treated them well, then they were happy. If they didn't treat them well, they were upset. But also, Egypt was enslaved to Israel. Because Israel was doing everything for them. And so as long as the Israelites were compliant, then the Egyptians got everything they wanted. And, and what I want you to see here is that the sinful nature that makes us selfish also makes us self-idolatrous, where we're worshiping ourselves, we're elevating ourselves, but that selfishness enslaves us to other people. Because when I'm selfish, what do I want? I want what I want. I don't care what you want, I want what I want. And in order for me to get what I want, you got to do whatever I want you to do in order for me to get what, you, what I want. Amen? And so if you're not doing what I want you to do to get what I want, then I don't like you. And, and I get upset, and my peace is dependent upon you. And my joy is dependent upon you. And so selfishness makes me a slave to what you do. I can't have peace unless you're happy with me. I can't have love unless you show me affirmation. I can't have joy unless you're celebrating who I am. I can't have anything unless you're doing what I need you to do for me to get what I want. I'm enslaved to you. It happens in marriage all the time uh, when I'm doing uh, couples counseling. and, and, And the husband will say, well, she made me mad. You ever heard that? Have you ever said that? Can I get honesty over here? Yeah. <laughs> she made me mad. He made me mad. The thing is, though, then they'll use that as an excuse to do whatever they're doing. They'll say, well, if she would just quit doing this, then I could do that. And I said, well, then <laughs> maybe we should just stop doing marriage counseling right now. <laughs> But what is that? That means I'm a slave to them. And Jesus says that he is my portion. If I have Jesus, then I have all I need for peace. I don't need my wife to do anything. I don't need my kids to do anything. I don't need you to do anything. If he is my joy, then it doesn't matter what the world does. It doesn't matter who gets elected. It doesn't matter what's going on in the news. My joy is based in Jesus Christ and him alone. Amen? And, and so when, when you are living a selfish life, you're, you're in that thing and it's trapping you and enslaving you to other people. And so we're constantly living according to what they do, what they say, what they believe, and we don't have any freedom. And so the Lamb of God, Jesus is trying to say, I will break you free from your enslavement to what other people do, what they say, how they act, so that your joy is in me. Amen? This is what he's doing. He is our portion. Now, let me read this in Exodus 12, and I'm going to get into how they were to sacrifice the lamb. Exodus 12, verse 1. It says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. So he's establishing the, the Jewish calendar. 
He says, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. So the 10th day of the month. Now, this happens to also be Palm Sunday. And so in the same day that, that people are going out into their flocks to find the perfect lamb, Jesus is riding into Israel for Israel to choose him to be their lamb. And he is showing up so they can inspect him and make sure that he is perfect. And it says, if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. Having taken into account the number of people there are, you are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Now, the 14th day of the month, and this is the day that Christ dies. And so he rides in on the 10th day. He is crucified on the 14th day. The day that Jesus dies on the cross, everybody in Jerusalem is also slaughtering their own Passover lamb. He says... Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of their door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it until morning. If some of it is left, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. That's a lot of instructions on how to take the lamb. Now, understand, the lamb of God is saying, uh, this is God coming and, and releasing power to break free from our enslavement of people and our enslavement to our own negative cycles. Just like Israel got free of slavery, he's trying to say, I am, I am dying for you. My blood is to release power so you can break free. The problem that we have is we take the lamb and we don't take it the way we're supposed to take it. And so these instructions become very important. He says, you're going to take the lamb and put the, the blood on the doorpost uh, uh, and on the sides of the door. Now, you need to know a little bit about Israel uh, in Egypt during that time. Egypt, when they would build buildings, if it was a temple, the temple represented eternity. So they would build the temple with stone. But if it was their house, their house did not represent eternity, so it would be built out of mud. But in order for them to live in eternity, they had to maintain their name. So what they would do in their mud houses, they would take the door frame and it would be made out of stone, and then they would carve their name into the stone. They would carve it on the top and on the sides. And so the Israelites would have done the same thing. So when God tells Moses, take the blood and smear it on the top and the sides, he's saying, cover up your name with my blood. It, it, it is this idea that you are no longer going to be you, but now you are going to be me. You're no longer going to be that person stuck in the same cycle, cycle, stuck in slavery to other people. You're not going to be that same person doing the same damage, the same pain, the same stuff over and over. I'm going to erase who that is, and now you're going to live in me. It's a powerful, powerful moment. And what we do is we don't die to ourselves. We say, well, I'm a Christian, but then we keep living for ourselves. We keep maintaining our name. And sometimes we'll even do Christian things for us. We want to be a Sunday school teacher so we can say, "Woo, look how good of a teacher I am. We want to be a preacher so we can stand up and say, "Woo, look how good I preach. And we are doing things. We we're feeding the homeless. We're doing whatever, but we're doing it for us. And if you're going to release the power to break free, you have to do it for him, not for you. Amen? Now, here's what he says. He says, roast the lamb. Everybody say roast. I just wanted to get you a little hungry. Now, the thing is, if you boiled it, when you boil it, the bones will eventually break. And so you had to have the whole lamb without defect so a bone cannot be broken. If you remember when Jesus hung on the cross, uh, crucifixion would take days sometimes for somebody to die. And so if they needed you to die quickly because of Passover, they would come and they would break your legs because the way you would stay alive on the cross is you would push and lift up so you could expand your lungs and breathe. And so they would break your legs so you couldn't push up anymore so you'd drown on your blood. And so when they came to Jesus to break his legs, he was already dead. And so none of his bones were broken. He stayed the perfect lamb. 
Amen? And, and so it, it says roast it so that none of the bones are going to be broken because you got to take the whole lamb. One of the reasons we never break free from our past, we never break free from those negative cycles and we're doing the same stuff over and over again is because we're not all in. We don't go all in. We don't say, I'm, I'm all in. I'm going to have the whole lamb. See, we like the parts of Jesus that are good, right? There no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Amen. Praise God. The Lord will give to me all that I need according to his riches and glory. Praise God. But then he says, take up your cross. And we like to skip over that part. If you want to break the cycles, you've got to take it all in. Amen? He says, do this with your family. And if your family's too small, bring your neighbors in. You can't do it by yourself. Going back to what Pastor Zach was saying just a little bit earlier, if you're going to break the cycle, you can't live Christianity by yourself. We live in a world right now where everybody's saying, well, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, so they don't go to church. They don't have any kind of community. There's no Bible study. They're not talking to anybody about the things of God. If you're not connected with other people, you will not get free. We have to be connected with other believers because we need encouragement. We need exhortation. We need somebody saying this is what the Bible says when we forget. We need, we need somebody that's going to hold us accountable when we get outside the lines. We need somebody who's going to pray for us when we're hurting and we're ready to give up. We need each other. Amen? And so we need church. And so if you don't have that, it, you're going to get stuck. You're going to have a place in heaven, but this life is the same old mess over and over and over again. And you're missing the lamb. And then he says, put sandals on your feet and a staff in your hand. What is he saying? He's saying, get ready to move. Get ready to travel. And so where were they going to travel? Out in the wilderness. Now, they've been in Egypt. Now, in Egypt, they woke up every day. They were slaves. They went out and worked. And then their masters fed them. And so what he's saying is you need to move out of a place or move your life into a place where you are totally trusting God, not anybody else. The Bible says that, that Moses did not get to enter into the promised land because in one moment he did not trust God enough. And so there are places, how do you know if you trust God? Obedience. Everywhere that we're not living in obedience, everywhere we're not doing what God wants us to do, that is a lack of trust because God's saying, if you want the very best life, this is how you do it. And we're like, yeah, I think this would be better today. And so we have to be ready to travel. And the last thing he says is eat it in haste. And what we do is we kind of like to have a slow roll. And God tells us to do something. I mean, how many times does God has, has to, does he have to tell us to do it before we actually do it? God had to tell me that I was supposed to be a pastor. I don't know how many times over and over and over again. I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. I've seen that. No. I want to be a football player. That's what I want to do. Bless me in that. And that's what I would say. I would say, God, I don't want to be a pastor. I know you want me to be a pastor. I don't want to do that. I want to be a football player. Bless me there. Selfishness. Living for God in my own selfishness. Of course, he took care of that with a couple of bad knees. <laughs> but he says, eat it in haste. So what's God saying to you? Do it. I'm always amazed at Abraham when, when God says, uh, I want you to take your only son and go and sacrifice him. And the Bible says early the next morning he got up to go do it. Even when it doesn't seem right, even when it hurts, do it when God tells you to do it. Amen? And then let me just read this last thing. What happens when we do this? In Exodus 12, verse 12, he says, On the same night I will pass through Egypt. I will strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Amen? That's what he's saying. When you take the lamb in the way you're supposed to take the lamb in, no death touches you. The death that came to them was the death of their firstborn. This is God saying, I will protect your family. The firstborn was also responsible for provision. They had to make sure everybody in the family got fed. And so he's saying, I will take care of your provision, all your needs. 
The firstborn was also the priest of the family. And he was saying, I will make sure that you don't lose communion with me. And so when, when, when this happens, and, and so many of us don't have the blood covering our name. We're not obeying him quickly. We're procrastinating. We're waiting. We're like, yeah, I'm not quite ready for that one yet. And all the while, we're stuck in this negative, negativity, doing the same things, hurting the same people, ruining our lives, wondering where is God. And the whole time God is saying, just, just come to me. All the way. All the way. Amen. Stand up and let me pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would help us understand that you didn't call us just to get out of the darkness, but you also call us to live into the light. That we would not just be saved, but that we would be sanctified. That we wouldn't just reserve a place in heaven, but our life today would be wonderful and beautiful and incredible. Lord, I pray for anybody here today that is stuck in that negative cycle. Help them see that their life is supposed to be so much more than that. Give them the desire and the discipline to say, I'm going to take in the whole lamb. I'm taking his blood and covering my name. I'm dying to self so that I can live for him. And Lord, help them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if they will do that, death will pass over them. We praise you. We praise you. I want to